Hello, and welcome to the Learn to Code podcast here at One Month. You know, I created this podcast because I noticed that a lot of my students were using code in really interesting ways that weren't always just building websites. You know, there's lots of journalists, MBAs, uh, product managers, entrepreneurs, people who are learning to code, but coding is not their main thing. And so on this podcast, it's been really great to share a lot of these stories um, that I think are just super inspirational and also learn like how did you know, how did you learn to code is the question I love to ask, you know, because it's so interesting. I mean, we, you know, we see so many successful people who are doing cool things with code. I love to hear those stories of how they learn to code. And so that's what we go into every, every week. Hello world. We have a newsletter. I have one. Uh, I read it. And uh, if you'd like to be part of the newsletter, you can go to one month.com forward slash newsletter and sign up. And if you sign up, you will get updates on the latest podcast guests, my writing that I put out every week, as well as some um, some secret office hours that we hold, some Q&A sessions, as well as tips, reviews, and special offers on all the different kind of tools and resources and books that you will need when you're learning to code and really just staying up to date with, uh, with technology in general. So the newsletter is awesome, and you can get that at onemonth.com forward slash newsletter. Sign up there, and you will get the next issue. Today on the show, we have a really special guest. Zed Shaw is here to talk about his book series, Learn Code the Hard Way. Uh, it's a really popular book series. Millions of people have read it. Uh, you may know it from some of the more popular titles in the series, like Learn Python the Hard Way, Learn Ruby the Hard Way. And if you're thinking, why would I want to learn something the hard way? Uh, well, First off, it's not that hard, as we'll, as you'll see in our chat. We talk about why Zed named it the hard way and the reaction that he often gets from uh, the book publishers that he's worked with, as well as students. Uh, but the truth is, uh, in some ways, I think Zed Shaw has like a no nonsense kind of like, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of work, but also it's not that hard once you get to start doing it. And that's the exciting thing about learning to code. A lot of times, it feels like this like there's this barrier to getting started and. And wow, you know, get, get the, getting started really is the hardest part. <laughs> you know, it's really just that those first, you know, those first few months getting started that are tough. And uh, and that's what we talk about in my chat with Zed, how he got started learning to code, uh, why he's so passionate about teaching people to code, his book series, how to get the most out of his Learn to Code the Hard Way series, and what you could and um, and should consider doing after you read the series, whether it's going to a boot camp or using Codecademy or different other resources um, that are out there. We here at One Month have been fans of Zed's work for quite a long time. In our online Learn Python bootcamp, we share Zed's resources as a supplement. We say, hey, you know, we know that you're learning Python with us, and also this would be a really great book and kind of supplement to learn alongside what you're learning. Especially the his command line breakdown of how to use the command line is super useful. I would definitely recommend to check that out. Without any further ado, here is my chat with Zed Shaw of Learn Code the Hard Way. Hey, Zed, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I love doing interviews like this, so this is kind of fun. I've been using your series for quite a few years right now, and we recommend it to our students, so I'm definitely excited to hear about all things hard way, all things the hard way. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, the hard way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Originally, um, yeah, learn Python the hard way. Um, it was sort of like a tongue-in-cheek joke. It was kind of this thing where, um, uh, I, I was sort of considered the hard way only because you know a lot of other ways you learn stuff is more, um, uh, constructivist. I guess is the way to do it. Where like you don't do any rote practice, you're kind of just thrown in the deep end of the pool. And I always consider that difficult. Um, but when I was writing my book, people were like, "This is hard." I'm making them actually type code and actually like learn how to write code. And so uh, I just started calling it the hard way. I'm like, well, it's the hard way. It's better. It's, it's actually easier. Just keep doing it. Um, <laughs> but originally that, that, that name is what kept uh, a lot of uh, like publishers from trying to publish it. So in a way it worked out for me because then I went and published it myself. And so now I'm totally self-made because of that. Um, and then eventually most people got it. Like, you know, it's not really hard. It's just different. Did people complain when they heard the title "Learn Learn to Code the Hard Way"? Did they think, you know, hey, did they email you and say, "Hey, I don't want to do this. It's too hard. It sounds too hard." Um, no, I think the thing was is that um, I think other programmers told friends of theirs who wanted to learn, "Yeah, this is the book. 
right? Because other programmers basically learned that same way. You know, typing in tons of code, that's how you learn. Like, that's how almost everyone learns is typing in code. And I think most of the uh, programmer books at the time, they weren't really for beginners, you know? They were, like, uh, for people they assumed had already been programming for um, at, at least, like, a couple years, you know? Um, so mine, I made you type a bunch of code in, and that was kind of weird for folks, but programmers told their friends, yeah, yeah, that, that'll work, do this one. Hmm. Um, the people who really hated it were the experienced programmers. They hated it. They hated being told to type all this code in. I got um, angry emails like, you're patronizing me. This is offensive. I'm like, I'm not, it's not for you, actually. It's, it's for people who know nothing, you know? So it's kind of funny. I had to actually put a little warning at the beginning. If you're an expert, you're going to hate this book. <laughs> and if you're a beginner, it's going to be great. I want to get into talking about how you started that series. But first, I want to hear just your story. How did you learn to code? Uh, so me, my story is a little on the odd side because um, originally I, uh, oh, I have a very, my family is very poor, but we did have a computer for a short period of time uh, from when I was 12 to about 14. And so that's where I first learned to code, you know, as a young kid. And that's sort of the, the story you hear from everybody who codes who's about my age. I'm 45 right now, or about to be 45. And so um, everyone from my era, we learned to code because someone got a VIC-20 computer or a Commodore, or if you're rich, you got the Amiga, you know. And um, I had like a little Tandy. Uh, do you even know what Tandy is? It was like a Radio Shack computer. Um, it was I've kind heard of, of like it, a PC. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I had so a I had a Commodore back in the day, so that was a Commodore. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, we only had that for a little while, though, and then um, it, it was gone, lost it. You know, just bad fortunes and things. So then I lost my ability to code entirely. But I joined the army, and so in the army, I realized, you know, there aren't. I wasn't going to be in the army. I was just doing it for college money. And what I realized, I I, I remembered I could code, and that was like one thing you could get a job doing. You know, when I got out of out of the army, I was like, well, hey, I could go code. And I went back and instead of buying a car, like everyone, when they get their first paycheck in the army, they go buy a car. I went and I bought a computer. Um, I remember it took weeks for them to make it. It was like a thousand dollars. It was a wimpy little computer compared to our standards. Like, seriously, I think like your phone is is like 400 times more powerful than my first computer. Um, so then at 19, I had to reteach myself and it took me like, I want to say like four more years to get to where like I felt like I could code like I did when I was younger. Um, but the advantage of that was I was sort of an adult at that point. So I was very aware of how I learned to code. And I think that's something you see with people who learn things as an adult is they're more self-conscious of how things work and how they think. Whereas when people are children, their brain doesn't really work right. So then they have a lot of self-reflection going on. It's just sort of like natural raw learning ability. And so because I had to teach myself to code at an older age uh, all over again, um, that was one of the reasons why when I went to write my book, I was more aware of what I actually did to learn it and why I was able to write my book the way I did. When you say you were learning to code at 19, what programming language were you learning? Uh, so when I was a kid, I learned basic. So the old school basic, like not even, uh, I think it had function subs. It's like a new, the new, like awesome thing. No objects, nothing. And then I taught myself, uh, a C and I had to get a pirated copy of turbo C compiler from like a BBS. Uh, so yeah, everyone should look up BBS as the most awesome thing. And then, uh, can you explain what a BBS uh, is for people listening and like how you got BBS. Involved? And so BBS was, uh, before the internet, you could dial some other guy's computer and then you can go into like a little, a little world. It was almost like you went to his house party over the phone lines. Your phone literally dialed and it made like the fax sounds if anyone's heard of fax. Like even a fax is too old. And um, it was sort of like an internet website that you could only dial with your phone. And uh, you could do things like use this thing called FidoNet. You would like write someone an email and then a month later you'd get a reply because they had to route it by calling a sequence of phones to get it to wherever they were. And um, it was fun. It was awesome. This was basically like uh, very, very early on. And so when I was when I was 19, I was also doing the BBSs and stuff. But when I was younger, you could go onto some BBSs and you could download over like super slow phone lines, things like Turbo C. And I got another one that was uh, Modula 2 was the next language I learned, which is sort of like a um, kind of is by the same guy who did Pascal, Nicholas uh, Vert uh, or Worth. 
And then um, after that, I kind of didn't do much more because that's when I, I lost the computer. Um, so then when I went back in the Army, I, I basically, first thing I learned was C. I just went and I learned C. Um, I even went and ordered um, a version of Linux. It was one of the first times Linux came out. So this would be like 92-ish, I think, 93. Mm-hmm. It was called Egratisil Linux. And it came in like a huge box of 72 3.5 floppy disks. Oh, you had to put my each God. one in. <laughs> so this was this was a whole weekend. And if you screwed up one order, like you put in number 78 uh, before number 76, then the whole thing was messed up. You had to erase your hard drive and start over. So it took me like a week to get Linux onto this computer. Because uh, this is before the internet. This is before um, anything. You got You got things in the mail, right? And so that's how I got Linux up. And then I was getting good at Linux. I was like a, a master at Linux pretty quick because it just, it just wasn't much to master. It was like, it was like you know, on floppy disks. So it's not like a huge thing it is now. And then I was learning C because all the tools were there, the GNU compiler, everything. It was, it was just the easiest way to get a professional C compiler. Um, and it was funny because I got so good at Unix that I needed one floppy disk from a Gratisil. And I was stationed at this base that was uh, basically the telephone system for the NSA. And so they had really good internet. So I went into work. I was like, oh, I'll just connect to this FTP server and I'll download this one floppy disk. So I just connect the FTP server using the military network. I didn't know that this was like super duper illegal. <laughs> so they <laughs> basically reprimanded me. They wanted to know what I was doing to connecting to that foreign site. I said, oh. it's, it's this free Linux. It's a free Unix. They went, free Unix? Tell us about this. And they were like really interested in this free Unix that could have saved them tons of money. So that's the only reason why I got away with it. Normally it's like super illegal, <laughs> but uh, they realized I was just a nerd who really wanted to get this one floppy disk. And then I showed them Linux and I showed them how to do all this stuff. And they just gave me a formal reprimand and then said, do you want a job as a programmer? And I was like, no, I kind of just want to get out of the army. <laughs> so oh my like, God. Who was that? Um, I'm curious about who that person was that you're saying, you're saying we, was it like one of your, I don't know how to say like people that you reported to or, or somebody in the technical yeah, department. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's like a sergeant, my sergeant, oh, sergeant. Was the one okay. who, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sergeant, my sergeant, the ones who had to reprimand me, but there was another sergeant. He was a master sergeant. He was like in charge of the security for the place. And then there was, um, actually the commander, the, the Lieutenant commander was the guy who, the top, top, top guy for the unit. And I guess he was the one who was like, Oh no, that guy's cool. Um, no, I think the reason why he thought I was cool is I was bored one night on um, on duty. So I was actually, you have to stay up for 24 hours and guard the the barracks to make sure like people don't come in and people don't leave. And uh, I got really bored. So I was just kind of like punching a wall. I was just in there bored, just trying to stay awake. So I'm just like punching this wall. And then I hear, <clears throat> and I turn around. I'm like, oh man. And he's standing there. He just came in to check on people. And he was like this old school army ranger. So he thought it was so cool. I was over there uh, practicing punching a wall. And so after that, we were like really good friends. He'd invite me over to hang out. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm like this dumb 20 year old kid hanging out with this guy who's like an army ranger with a computer science degree from MIT <laughs> and my commander. Yeah. It was weird. My first duty station was bizarre. It was so weird. Um, but anyway, so that's how I learned to code. I was actually stationed at a place where um, it was a high technology place and I was able to get, and it was very stable. So it wasn't wartime. It wasn't anything. And I could get a computer and then I could study. And it was, it was tough because I would go in at 6 a.m. and I would have to do all the army stuff until like uh, 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. And then I would go home and I would just code. That's mm. all I would do is just code. And then I would get up and I would go to work and I would code. That was my whole life. Were you learning to code just on your own because you wanted to get a job afterwards? Yeah, so I was learning to code on my own to get a job, right? I see. But yeah. they, did, they did need programming. Um, a lot of it. The problem was, is you had to have a really good security clearance and I had a trouble just getting, I had a lot of trouble just getting the security clearance, the basic, basic one I needed for my job. So my job at the base was nothing high tech or high security. It was, I was a supply clerk. So basically I gave people toilet paper. It was like not, not high speed at all. Uh, I ran a warehouse. That was my big thing. And so I needed a secret security clearance though, because I would deliver parts and paper and things mm-hmm. like that uh, to the super secret building. So I need a secret security clearance just to walk in with a pallet of stuff and give it to them. Like I wasn't even really allowed to walk around much inside there and I had to sign off. So that's how high, high security it was. But wow. uh, the, 
the funny thing was um, I had friends who loved Dungeons and Dragons and okay. they found out that I knew how to, re- how to run a D and D game. So they would sneak me in and they would sign me in to go into their bay late at night. Cause they'd have to work 24 hour, you know, like 12 hour shifts. So they'd be working late at night. I'd be up late. Hey, you want to play some D and D? So I would go in and there'd be like me and like three dudes just doing D and D for like, you know, six hours till the sun comes up. Then I would get up and I would go run and do all my army stuff. You know, when you're young, you have way more energy to do this kind of thing. So, <laughs> so that was my first duty station. What I did is I learned to code and then I used, I wrote little C programs to automate my job. So I kept basically automating myself out of a job and then they would give me a new job and I would automate myself out of that job and just kept giving me jobs. And I didn't realize that I actually could have made some money. Like if, uh, I think my sergeant made all the money on my work because if you save the army money, they give you money. Oh. They give you like a, a two, two to 10% of it. And after you learned to code in this experience at the army, did you then go and study computer programming in college or what college degree did you, did you get if you went to college at all? Uh, yes. Yeah, so right after that, so keep in mind, like I, I was extremely poor and I knew that the way out of that was getting a college degree. And this is long before uh, the insane uh, tuition that we have today, right? Yeah. So my my yeah my job my tuition I think I came out of school with sixteen thousand dollars in debt, um, and that was with a GI bill, and I also worked at the university, so it, it was pretty expensive still back then. This is ninety uh, ninety six to ninety nine. I f- I was so hard charging to get my degree done. I did it in three years. Um, I got a 3.6 and I just did just my degree. That was it. And I worked full time at the university at the same time. What was your degree in? Um, And then I got it in computer information systems. So I went over to the computer science department and they had this guy and uh, he was teaching a class in assembly language. And I could already code assembler, C, Pascal, uh, C++, uh, a few other languages. This is old school back in the day when everything was compiled. And so he's teaching it and he's like talking about assembly. So I'm like, you know, I know assembly. It's no big deal. And then he'd pass out a test and I could take the test. And then he tries to mark my, um, my code wrong. And so I, I set up office hours with him because he was actually wrong about it. And so I'm in the test. I'm like, yeah, actually, no, this is wrong. This is the way this thing works. And he's like, well, that's, you only think that because you know the assembly language. And so I'm like, well, that, then that's how it actually works. And you got this, I should get this point back. He's like, no, you're wrong. And he starts yelling at me. So then I was like, maybe I shouldn't be in the computer science department because <laughs> I'm sitting here like, you know, basically telling the professor he's wrong and it's probably going to be just a lot more of that. Um, but also the computer science department had a lot of insane requirements. And it was, they were kind of over the top. There's a lot of extra engineering. It would take you five years to get the degree. And I wanted to finish it and get out. So I went over to the business school. And I found out that the business school was way better because I had a logistics background from the army. So they gave me tons of credits for army, for uh, my logistics work, because uh, it was Arizona State and they had um, a huge logistics department. And then I could take uh, programming classes, economics, sociology. I took dance classes. Like the business school didn't care at all. They just did not care. And so I did my whole degree in like three years. like, And I got this 3.6 GPA. And only because like, I mean, honestly, like a lobotomized monkey could probably get us 3.6 at a business school, but um, uh, it was really great because I got to study anything I wanted. I studied jazz history, which then got me into wanting to play jazz. Um, yeah, it was it was like the best decision instead of computer science. Wow, so you've been studying computers your entire life. It's pretty amazing. And then in college as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things is um, I was sort of – uh, fortunate enough to become attracted to this thing, you know, computing when I was learning, uh, trying to learn it as a kid, um, was considered a bad thing. It was like, you know, up there with comic books and video games, like you were just a nerd and a loser if you wanted to do that. Um, and then, uh, but I knew that it was a good job at least, you know, like, like my dream job, just to give you an idea of like how long ago it was. Um, I remember when I was a kid and I was a programmer, I used to tell people like, wouldn't it be awesome if you could get a job and you're at a desk and you make like 30,000 a year, you know, yeah, I was yeah. like, that was, that was my goal. Yeah. You know, it was like a desk job that paid 30 K a year, you know? Um, and then fast forward to now, I mean, a desk job paid 30 K a year as a programmer. Uh, I don't even think there's too many of those maybe as like a junior or an intern. I think now they're pushing well, 120, 250 sometimes, you know? Sure. Yeah. Especially here in New York. Yeah. 
Um, wow. So yeah, um, that's really interesting. You know, I'm watching this show now on Amazon called The Valley of the Boom, which is about mostly about Netscape in 93, 94, the IPO and this whole situation, um, this kind of startup fever. I think it's interesting, your story, because you were one of these, you know, you knew a lot about programming right around the time of the internet bubble, uh, internet well, boom, we can say, uh, in the late 90s. Was there any temptation or did you see people around you who were trying to either hire you or did you have an idea where you were like, I should start a startup? Was there that pressure or was that not attractive to you? Um, yes, actually. So um, I was kind of like um, bad timing all around. So for me, I got out of the army in 1996, right? So I was in from 92 to 96. And I got out a little early. Like if you get accepted to a college, they let you out like uh, six months or three months early, something like that. And so um, that means I got out in 96. So while I was in the army, um, I remember I said I, I loved BBSs. So I was I was dialing into these BBSs and doing my BBS thing and coding at night. It was awesome. I loved that time. I really miss it. But then one day the internet came out. And, you know, this is a weird thing I would love to study about, like, society and tech. I remember I was doing BBSs, the internet came out, and then BBSs disappeared. Like, overnight almost. I remember uh, the guy I was doing, he's like, hey, I'm shutting my BBS down, I'm going to start selling people internet access. Because he, he could do that, he had the phone lines. So all he had to do is just switch his phone lines, and he became an ISP. So it's really interesting. Then right after that, boom, you had to have Netscape. You had to have a computer that could run Netscape. I had Linux. So I just installed Netscape. I had access to the internet. So now I'm downloading tons of software. Like things just changed overnight. Mm. Like literally, I think. And you know, it's sort of weird because I have to dredge that memory up. I just accept the internet as real. Like I got a watch that I can walk around now and I can get phone calls on, you know, like, yeah. like that's like so future, you know, like I'm thinking like, Man, like 19-year-old me would never even imagine that I'd be able to do that now. Yeah. Well, then I'm making sure. money teaching people to code off the internet, you know? Download a video? No way. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so when I was getting out of the Army, yes, that's true. I had the opportunity to go work for a company that I, I think it eventually became Level 3. I forget who it was. It was like in Boston and then a few other companies in the Valley but I kept telling myself, no, I have to go get a degree because if you have a degree, you have a future. And looking back, even back then, my programming skills were good enough and in my army experience and my security clearance, I could have actually gone and just started working. But I always had this thing, you know, I guess just being poor, you always think, oh, the people who seem to have jobs are people with degrees who went and got college. That's what I'm going to go get is college, right? Um, so I went right in and then I was like, okay, I got my college. Now I'm going to go to the Valley in 1999, right? And like, I swear the month I graduated is when the dot-com boom happened and it just imploded. And after that, like you could get a job back then for like a 120K coming out. That's how hot they were. And then overnight again, boom, it imploded. And I think I couldn't even get a job for like uh, 30K. I was fine with 30K at the university, but you know, like you're trying to go get more back then. It, it went up to around 60K was the average. So I just stayed at the university for a few years well, until well, I could find a decent job. You were in Silicon Valley at that time. No, I was in Arizona State. I was oh, just I, an employee of the university. Yeah, oh, I was going to okay, go. Okay. I was going to go. And oh, it, you were going it, to go. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I, I graduated. I think it was like a month before I graduated. All the news just everything oh. just imploding and just turning to dust overnight. And the salaries for programmers just de depleted over oh, like immediately. Um, there was sort of this sentiment of, um, yeah, finally we can get back at those coders who were charging us too much money. So like jobs went down, nobody was hiring, everybody left San Francisco in the Valley. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, um, that made me hate the Valley. So for years, I just didn't, I didn't even entertain jobs there. I went to New York, I went to Vancouver, British Columbia, I went everywhere, Seattle area, everywhere except Silicon Valley. Um, because I was under the impression that there were a bunch of jokers who just didn't know how to run anything and that it was never going to make any money. You, you were wrong. Yes. <laughs> they, they figured um, out how to yeah. make money again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the reason I think that I was wrong is because the narrative about the dot com boom was kind of manipulated and it's always, it's always put forward as 
uh, pets.com is the example where people put forward these ideas that were dumb. They're like, yes, it's, the dot com boom happened because stupid people invested in dumb job, uh, dumb mm-hmm. companies. And if you look, a lot of the ideas that came out back then were actually totally viable. Like you look now, there's almost exact analog parallels of businesses that were proposed during the um, during the dot com boom, right? And if you think um, Amazon was, early. was kind of the yeah, they they were super early. They were right there, right? And they survived. They did just fine, right? Yeah. Uh, the real thing that caused the dot com boom and then the bust was shady banks. And that's we actually created a regulation called Sarbanes Oxley because of this. And so All what right. they would do is right, what they would do is they would go in and they would find some terrible startup that seemed catchy, had a cool name, right? And they would say, "Hey, we're going to invest in you." And so they would invest, but it was a terrible idea. Nobody should invest. For some reason, the banks did. And then they would have their analysts. Um, uh, Peter Bloggett actually went to jail for doing this. Um, they would have their analysts uh, go out and pump it up. Yeah, this is a hot stock. You should buy this. Because nobody knew tech, so they would dump all their money in it. And then the banks would make money selling the stock. And then they would wait a little while, and then they would have their analysts go, oh, hey, that company sucks. And then they would make money on the shorting and then uh, tank the company. That's interesting. I yeah. actually, I haven't heard that story. Right. Is that, is that, um, is it like a documentary about that or is that just kind of your, your experience? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. That's, there's a, there's a few books. If you want, I can, I can get you it. I want to say it's blood in the streets, but that might be about the 2008 collapse. Okay. Or it might be about uh, long-term capital management. Actually the entire history of banking is nothing but boom and bust from dumb investments. So, um, the reason why I say it was the banks is before the banks got into investing in these things and doing their pump and dump schemes, um, most of the companies that got investment had to have a good idea because it was all venture capital centered in the valley or military contractors that actually knew what they were talking about. So you couldn't come in with an idea or a business plan that was not legit. Once the banks figured out they could pump up a, a company, do some ads, and then dr- dump it, that's when you started having the instability and you had the dot com boom. Mm, it, it reminds me a lot of how um, how Bitcoin, you know, of course, the 2017 rally that it had, and you would see people like John McAfee would, you know, he would come out and he would just talk about he talked about Verge, which was this cryptocurrency, and he would make videos about it. And of course, he was an investor in it, and he would just kind of pump it up. I don't, I don't know if he bust i don't know if he like sold or i don't know i don't really know anything beyond that but i know that there was like definitely people who would just come out and like talk up these cryptocurrencies and then of course yeah. as we all know like in december of 2017 was it um you know things kind of mm-hmm. fell apart so for the time being yeah it's the same thing <laughs> yeah um yeah so the regulation we created Sarbanes oxley uh, was specifically for that purpose and it forced i worked at a bank bear stearns and what it does is it forces the investment banking side, the side of the bank that invests in companies, to not be able to talk to the analyst side without someone sitting there from legal, right? Um, I think they're trying to get rid of that, which is going to be a disaster. Because if you think about it, they have a vested interest in manipulating the stocks, right? So like, And then also, uh, somehow they managed to spin it that the reason the do- all these companies collapsed is because they were dumb. And it was more like, yeah, they were dumb, but they only existed because there was money thrown at them to run a pump and dumb scheme, you know? Mm-hmm. So none of those com- none of those companies would have happened. The, the valley wouldn't have collapsed and I would have gotten a job. But instead, I took the narrative that it was stupid tech in Silicon Valley and I left. And then it wasn't until like years later when banking collapsed again and I started researching it because I was working at Bear Stearns the year the um, banks all collapsed in 2008. Oh, so I was okay. like, why does this keep happening? Yeah, I was working there, man. I was like, I remember I was at a PyCon and it collapsed and I got a text message on a Friday. Uh, hey, we're talking to JP Morgan. I got a text message on a Saturday. They're like, oh yeah, we just sold to JP Morgan. I got a text message on a Sunday. Um, yeah, it looks like you might have a job. <laughs> it was like did, three did days you, in this. Did you lose your job in the, in the 2008 crash? Um, they gave me a severance and uh, they wanted me to stick around. I was like, no, I'm out. Uh, this That was sort of like a turning point for me because like, again, bad timing. I had bad timing. I joined in 2008 and they collapsed like 10 months later Wow. because I was sick of startups not paying me my consulting fee. So I'm like, I'm going where the money is. I see. Yeah. And, uh, and it turned out that was not a good move either. You know, so it's like a sequence of super bad timing, super bad luck. I graduate, 
uh, with a computer computer information systems programmer degree. The year everything collapses in programming, uh, wow. I managed to get a job at a bank. The year everything collapses in banking, you know. Got it. Um, okay, so then you're at Bear Stearns, and then I believe you worked briefly at Dropbox before where we started uh, the Hardaway series. Is that true? Is that is right, that kind right. of your? So how did you um, how did you get the idea for starting the project and teaching people how to code? Um, yeah, so basically, I had a friend who wanted to learn to code, and uh, she was in marketing, and she was she was doing marketing for all these programmers, and she had no idea what they were talking about, so she wanted to learn to code. And um, I had been thinking, I well, back up a little bit. After Bear Stearns collapses, I go to school to study guitar. Oh, and, okay. And uh, really all I've learned, yeah, really, I went to this kind of small jazz school in New York. It wasn't too great. It's called The Collective. Hmm. And all I really learned from there is that... Um, I'm not that good at guitar. That was about it. <laughs> like the guy, the teachers there were not very good. Um, because years later I, I started studying on my own after, after I sort of like one of the teachers did this crazy scales and had me like doing this really contorted thing with my guitar to keep my fingers straight. And it mm-hmm. actually wrecked my thumb and I had to stop playing. And then, um, uh, during that time though, I had to teach myself a lot because the teachers weren't too good. And I ran into this book called Mickey Baker's complete guide to jazz guitar. So it was by this guy who did, he was in the band, Mickey and Sylvia. He did that song, the really famous song from Dirty Dancing. That's what made him his money. And then after he started making tons of money, he's like, screw you. And he went to France and just kind of like lived in France for the rest of his life. Uh, But his book he wrote in like the fifties was organized with 52 exercises, one exercise a week. And you would do one tiny thing about playing jazz guitar each week. So you'd start with just the G chord in like two forms. And you sit there and do just G chords and then you do just C chords. Right. And so it's broken down like that. And that book was the only thing that helped me survive my jazz classes because, because of that book, I got a super good at playing chords and kind of some weird ones that they'd never seen. So they would at least let me stay in and do like the rhythm section stuff. Right. And so then this, when, so this idea forward, of, uh, this idea of doing like a little bit at a time really worked for you. Yes. God. Well, so what I figured out was this is a thing called a trainer. So a trainer book, and this is a much more of a, a, a musician concept. Uh, so you can find them all the time. You find one, I think Paganini wrote one. There's like, you know, a method for guitar, method for classical guitar, method for violin. What they do is they start very small and they teach like, here's the first four frets. Here's the next 10 frets. Here's one song. It's like done in these pieces. Uh, Mickey Baker's sort of innovation was that it was done in 52 pieces, one a week. So you would sit there and just practice it for a whole week and get kind of good at that and move on. And this is not a concept in programming. So I just basically borrowed the concept from music of a trainer, a trainer manual. And I said, well, what if I did a programming book that did that? Oh, yeah. And so because it worked for me and it works for people, it works for little kids. Like little kids go through these trainer books. You know, they do like... Uh, was it the Yamaha method, the one that does like Do Re Mi, something yeah, like that? Yeah, they do go through those books. Suzuki is right? a really popular violin. Suzuki, yeah, 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 yeah. Those those books aren't like programming books where they're like, um, here's the A note. Okay, now play Paganini. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. That's how programming books are. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, um, mine. I was like, hey, I could gradually build this up the way this really awesome music book did. Fifty-two exercises, one a week make it kind of more rote practice and set the idea for the book. Not you're going to be done and be a master programmer, but more when you're done with this book, you can go do other books. Because other books assume you already know how to code, which is wrong. That's why they're never really targeted at beginners. Um, At the time, yeah, like at the time, all the books were either, uh, they would say for beginners and totally not. They would do that thing where like, you know, like I said, here's the A note, now play this, piece of Bach. Oh, totally. Right. Um, right. Or they were for little kids. So they were like trying to be safe, you know, um, or they were cutesy kind of like, you know, like really obnoxiously cute. Um, not really explaining things too well, you know, cause they're like, you know, Oh, it's just little kids. They're going to do graphics. You know, everything had graphics for little kids, but it, it was totally unnecessary, you know? Yeah. So yeah. So my book was kind of, I want to think, I mean, maybe someone can correct me, but it was the first book where it was written for everyone. It didn't really care if you were an adult or a kid. 
um, it was written it w- humorously, and then it was written in a way that was very gradual, the way the books for kids were. So it was targeted at adults or anyone, but gradually built it up very slowly. And, and so and, is this um, Learn Python the Hard Way? Is that the title of this yeah, one? Yeah. Okay. This is Learn, Learn Python the Hard Way. That was the first one. Um, so I did it, and then I put it up online, just a PDF. You know, I kind of didn't care. I sort of wanted people to learn to code, because uh, from what I'd seen once I moved to the Valley was that everyone was going to get just demolished by tech. I could tell Facebook, I could tell Google, all those things are going to be massive. And they're going to control everyone's life, right? And I was thinking, you know, if, if people just don't even have a basic understanding of computing, it's going to be like um, not knowing how to drive, mm-hmm. you know, like... Like I actually don't know how to drive. I do, but like I got I bought a car when I was like when I was like twenty something, and I wrecked it four hours later. <laughs> so I was like, just decided not to own a car after that because I'm, I'm dangerous. And then I've always lived in cities without cars, so I actually don't drive. So when I say this, like in the future, not knowing how to code is going to be like not knowing how to drive. It's because I know what it's like not knowing how to drive, not having a license. You know, that's one of the and best it's tough. analogies. You can't get jobs. Yeah, that's what. Oh. Yeah, that's one of the best analogies I've heard. Yeah, um, sorry to cut you off, but I was just yeah, it yeah. made me it made me excited to think about like with that analogy with with learning to code. It's like you can kind of go from A to B. Like you can get an Uber, you can get in other people's cars. But the beautiful thing about when you know how to drive is that you can say, "Hey, I'm going from A to B. I'm going to the supermarket." But kind of along the way, you can take a shortcut. You can change. You can stop. You know, you can alter your route. It gives you this kind of like freedom when you actually know how to drive and you don't just have to rely on other people driving. Yeah, you have control. Right? You have control. You have control. Uh, so for me, yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, like, um, uh, I have to go wherever the buses go, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Or I walk. I do it. I do a lot of walking. It's kept me fit. I'm like, you know, I'm like fit, but uh, that's about the only advantage, <laughs> nice. you know? Yeah. So in, in New York, that's one of the reasons why I loved New York. Cause in New York, it's weird to own a car, right? Like if yeah. you ever known anyone who has a car, you're like, why do you have a car, man? Just take the subway. You're so strange. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so where do you park it? Where do you park it? Isn't that expensive? It's, it's an SUV. That's dumb. You know, and then everywhere else I've lived, it's the opposite. It's like, why don't you have a car? I mean, yeah. are you are you actually a man? Are you a member of society? Are you poor? Why don't you have a car? You know, <laughs> so it's kind of so interesting. Yeah, it's kind of funny. But the same thing I think is becoming true about programming, where it's going to be like not being able to be a master programmer. Like nobody expects everyone who drives to be a race car driver, right? Mm-hmm. They expect you to be able to drive semi competently so you don't cause an accident. So I think the same thing with programming, like. It just makes you semi-competent at using a computer, right? And so in the future, it's going to be like, well, you don't know how to type. You don't know how to touch type. You don't know how to like make a computer do what you want. Wow, like what, what what's wrong with you? Did you not go to a good school, right? It's going to be the same kind of thing with driving. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was my thing. I used to say learning to read, but I think it's not, you know, I honestly think if you told people learning to code is going to be like learning to drive in the future, they would be all over it. Because everyone is like, if my kid can't drive, he's going to have a terrible time at life not be able to get a job, uh, probably have very bad problems. I, and I can tell you that's semi-true. Uh, for me, I learned to code, so that's kind of the only reason I got around it. If I had any other job or, or profession, I would have had to learn to drive and had to go drive. I wonder, I'm, I'm imagining someone listening to this right now and thinking, well, automated cars are coming and they're going to make that perhaps irrelevant. Do you think that some kind of automation is going to make developers irrelevant? Um, yeah, you know, I, I honestly think, um, well, one thing I would say is uh, I really hope automated cars come along uh, just from the safety side, right? Um, I think what's going to happen is it's, I think automation is going to get pretty close for driving a car, but you're still going to have to have people who can kind of take over in emergency situations, right? Sure. Um, it's always the exceptional cases that seem to be where all programmers make mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. And so they can handle as long as as long as things are going great down the freeway, their cars are awesome. The second some semi turns in front of them and it's like a big, big mess the yeah, the cars don't do, do well. Right. Sure. So I think automation in the future for programming would be the same deal where it's like it just basically adds this massive multiplier and then makes it easier to write super high quality code. Right. But you're still going to have a person kind of figure out yeah. what to do, controlling it. And if, yeah. Doing that. I, I, I would so. love that. I. I yeah. I think that makes right. sense. No, yeah, I, th- I think that makes yeah, yeah. sense. I mean, yeah, so for me, I think that's true. Um, but, uh, you know, nowadays it's just, or going back to why I did my book, 
I put it up for free because I was like, you know, look, I, I think I think if people don't have control of their technology, or at least an understanding of what's going on, they're going to be taken advantage of. And um, uh, that first year it was about three hundred fifty thousand downloads. Wow! I actually wasn't even checking my logs. Yeah, I wasn't checking my logs. I was like, whatever. And then um, uh, I checked and I was like, oh wow! I even wow. posted on Hacker News. Okay. Prove me wrong. I have 350,000 downloads. Prove that I did not do this. And I put my logs up anonymized. And people are like, yeah, I mean, it could be like 150 to 350, you know, of a PDF that wasn't even finished. You know? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so you put this up. It was, it sounds like an overnight success. I mean, it pretty quickly it became a success. At, at that point, did you decide that you were going to do other languages or did you just stick with Python? Um, yeah, so at the time, uh, for me, this was not my main thing. My main thing was coding, right? Mm -hmm. And so I did the book as a side thing. And then it was up and I finished it. And I think right after that, um, right after I did my post and I put everything up, that's when the, the, the learn to code thing exploded. Like around right? 2010, like, boom. right? I'm guessing. Yeah, around 2010. Because I think I, I did my post or my announcement like late 2009-ish, I think. Sure. And then like six months later, Code Academy came out. Code Academy, yeah. Yep. Right? Um, so now I realize that was kind of stupid. I should have kept that to myself and gone out and got some VC money and been like, <laughs> yeah, the next Code Academy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I genuinely wanted to help people, so that's why I didn't do that, you know. And then once everyone was making money off of people learning to code, I had this mission in my mind of I want everyone I can I mean, possibly to learn to code for free. And so I just kept it up for free for a very long time. Um, yeah. But then shortly after that, I did Ruby. Got it. Got it. Um, what kind of student comes to take your courses? Or do you call them courses? Or do you call them books? Because I know you have an ebook, and now can you, yeah, can you just kind of describe it first? Because now you have some of the courses have free ebooks where you can learn Python or SQL or Ruby. Um, and some of them, I know that you can pay and then you get a video or you get some kind of added features. Can you kind of just tell us, you know, why we might come learn with you with the hardware series? Um, yeah. So the way they're structured. So I, I started, um, basically making videos because uh, the book is fine, but programming is very interactive, especially when you're doing debugging. Um, or trying to tell someone how to debug in text, like in a book, is nearly impossible. It's very it's very difficult. Installing packages is another one. Like installing stuff, you kind of have to see someone do it because you can miss a step in the instructions. Yeah. Um, so I started doing the videos, you know, and, I, and then I sell them. And so what I sort of stumbled on was if I do a video for each exercise and then I can sell the videos, but keep the text free. And so oh, that was okay. like my first jump. Right. So I keep the text free. And then if you need extra help, you buy the video from me as sort of a way to support me making the books free. Oh yeah. And then, um, uh, two years ago I took and basically all the books you have to buy, um, all the courses. Now I just call them a course, uh, except for Ruby. I kept the Ruby one up. And so that way, if, if people can't afford a book, the book, the Ruby and the Python book, the secret is they're exactly the same. I just have text replace macros that change Ruby to Python. Like, honestly, it's, and then a couple exercises are different. So I tell people like, you know, they want to learn Python and they want to go get a job. I'm like, well, look, go to learn Ruby. You should really try to learn about three programming languages. Yeah. Uh, it's like the third language is when it clicks. I say, do Ruby for free. Right. If you get to the end of Ruby book and you hate programming, then you didn't waste 30 bucks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people do that. And then my Python book I charge for, and then I wrote a follow on book called more Python where I basically get into tons of projects and like algorithms, designing a programming language, all done in like the same format, very small little exercises. Um, so the advantage to coming with me is that, it's a ton of content. Like if you got my Python book and then my more Python book, by the time you're done with that, you've covered pretty much 80% of computer science in a slightly shallow way. It's, it's, it's a little deep, but it's not too deep that you can't handle it. Yeah. And, um, well, tell us more. So competent. what kind of things could I expect to learn? I mean, I, I, I know cause well, first off, I'll say that at one month we recommend your command line course to our students. And so it's, it's, it's in our actual course in the videos we're saying like 
you know, go take Zed Shaw's uh, command line course because it's really helpful. Um, and we also we also share the Python course links as well. Um, so I've taken some of it, but can you tell people listening um, and me as well, kind of like, I haven't taken the more Python course. And so I also don't know exactly what else is in store. Like what can I learn in the Python course that you have, I guess, is my long question that I'm trying to yeah, get, yeah, yeah. get to. Yeah, short answer. That, that's what um, I'm going to do. So in the, in the first Python course, you just get, it's sort of like, um, I studied martial arts. So the idea of getting your uh, black belt in a martial art is not that you are now like any good it's just that you know the basics well enough that they can start teaching you the full martial art, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of concept. With learn Python the hard way, you don't come you, at the end of it. You're not like a very good programmer, but you know all the things, all the right? moves. So you know like, what you yeah. need to know. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you know the basics. So now I can teach you the real stuff. Okay. So then when learn more Python. You go through that, and I teach you the real stuff, and it's it's a lot. I mean, I. I tell people really you should do the more Python book first, just do all the projects and ignore Cause I include testing process, uh, personal development, how to manage your own, like actually do statistics to manage your own quality metrics and become like a better programmer. But it's a ton. So I say like, first do all the projects, just go through and do the projects. Ignore me when I'm telling you, you know, be a, be a good programmer and test, test, test. Then go back through and learn all the professional development stuff that's in that book where it's like it's a ton of professional development, um, everything from like quality testing, um, how to be creative, all kinds of stuff. About how many and, hours? Uh, honestly, it, I was going to say, how many hours does it take to complete Learn Python the Hard Way, the first part? Yeah, so Learn learn Python the Hard Way, um, if someone legitimately puts in like two to four hours a day, I've seen people finish it in about a month or two, right? If you know nothing. If someone has a background in something similar to programming, so music, believe it or not, people who are musicians just blaze through that book. Um, engineering, mathematics, um, you know, anything like that. Uh, philosophy, like you study logic, it seems to be pretty simple for them. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. Those people can go through in about like a month. I've seen someone with a math degree just go through it in like a week, right? Um, but to compare, I wrote the book. I can go through the whole book if I just blaze and type the code. Not doing the extra credits, just blaze through type the code. I can do the whole thing in four hours. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think a, I think a pro could probably do the whole book in like a day or two. Got it. Okay. Great. Right. That gives um, me good sense. Meanwhile, the more, yeah, the more Python book is meant to be sort of like a long project. So it's sort of like the kind of thing you do while you're doing other stuff. You do like one exercise a week while you're doing other stuff, mm -hmm. slowly building your skills. So that one, I'm imagining it takes someone like you know six months to kind of complete. Um, but when you're done, you know all the things. Like you know compiler theory, you know how to build websites, you know um, you know how to do tiny Unix tools, like everything you can imagine. And then coupled in with that, because I'm using the projects to sort of teach people how to make software, you know, how to build a thing. So in it is like quality, how to control your creative process, um, how to d how to make things solid, um, yeah. everything, distributing, making packages, everything. Really cool. Um, I heard you before you mentioned Codecademy. I'm curious, just like your thoughts on students using Codecademy or how it compares or differs to your series. Um, I think, so keep in mind for me, it's just me. So I don't have a whole lot of resources and stuff. Um, I'm focusing more on like high quality content and I don't have, I don't have designers. I don't have programmers. I'm the only programmer. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I can paint, but I don't know design. So I, I periodically hire someone to redo it, you know, things like that. Uh, so I don't have the resources they do. I think that's the first big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, um, my content is organized, so I don't really have to answer a lot of questions. Like as I answer questions, I fix my stuff. So that way it like reduces my help request. Mm -hmm. Whereas like a, a code Academy has a massive platform. Now they've got a lot of stuff. They, they basically, they spend a lot more money on what you give them. So if you sign up, they're going to spend a bunch of the money that you give them on making, on giving you a big product. Whereas as me, I'm a single entrepreneur, so I'm keeping my costs very low. So everything is very simple. Like you give me money, you download stuff, you go through it. That's about it. Um, but with them, they have a new platform coming out, I think, um, that's got like all kinds of things, help and forums and all the stuff, all the features. I see. Yeah. And I would say that's the primary difference. Yeah. Like even... um. General Assembly, uh, 
any of those platforms. It's just that they have tons of money to do a better platform. That's primarily the difference. Yeah. Um, and I mean, also your stuff reads more like, like a book. And I think in that way, I mean, just my experience is that it's kind of nice. Cause I feel like I can kind of like go ahead a little bit or kind of, I could kind of go on my own pace. I like with the hardway series, yes. whereas with code Academy, they try to gamify it away. Cause you have to use their text editor in the browser. And so sometimes it feels a little mm-hmm. bit like, um, like frustrating. Cause you know, I think, I think there's something really empowering about like being able to kind of like, you know, just like a book kind of like traverse, like go a little bit ahead, go go back and go through it and not kind of be like, you know, pushed through um, sometimes, especially when there's things that you don't understand, you know? So, um, so that's, that's, that's kind of one comparison. I think that, I mean, I think they both probably have different type, you know, different people learn different ways, but that's definitely um, one thing that I like about your series. So. Yeah. You know, I'm, I tell people I'm an advocate of use all the things. You know, me too. Like, I said, I said the same thing. Studying, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm currently studying painting and, and like, I watch videos, I go outside, I go to conferences, I go through books. Like I, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm a very much a pragmatist, right? Yes. You know, yeah. so I'm not like, I, I don't, I don't think about it as competition because, um, the, uh-huh. like you said, the advantage of my stuff is you use a real computer, not the browser. So that was a big decision I made. Everyone, when I made that book was like, put it in the browser. I'm like, no, yeah. the whole point is that people need to control their computer. So you learn the real deal. Like I make you lose the command line, you know, I a hundred percent agree. I a hundred percent agree. And you were right? doing that. You were doing that at a time when, um, when code Academy and code school were both in the browser and it's just, you're not really learning. Like, I don't want to say you're not learning anything, mm-hmm. but it's just, you're not a plot. It's like, it's like trying to learn dance by like me telling you it and you imagining it in your head, but you're not actually like really using the tools. So the problems you're running into mm-hmm. aren't, the exact problems that you're going to eventually run into when you're trying to work on the job. So, um, yeah, exactly. So I, yeah. I totally agree with that. It's like, you're saying. yeah, it's like with my C book, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, man. Like the majority of the problem with C is the computer, like crashes and segments yeah. and pointers, <laughs> you know, you can't do that in a browser. Like you, maybe you run a VM or something, but yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, in, yeah. in debugging, I, th- I would say, uh, debugging like our packages like the those are like monster topics for people like really difficult topics yeah um that's that's my primary reason for doing videos too is that totally I mean, you can sit there and yeah you can you can read a book about it but if you watch zed just like basically cursing trying to fix something you yeah. learn a lot, you know? i love it yeah you know we did we did analytics on our when we were launched our first course was called one month rails and we we had a few thousand students go through that in just a few months and we watched the analytics and what we found is that people were going to lesson number like three or four and then just like not that many people would continue uh, for, for a period of time. And what we noticed was like people had trouble installing the thing. So we spent a lot of time yeah. redoing that video. We made an entire site called installrails.com. We get support. Like that's when we started leaning on that stuff. And then we'd look at the analytics and, you know, this is around 2013, lo and behold, like once people get through the crashing of the computer, the installation, the, you know, that like that alone is really hard. And, you know, we had this aha moment of like, nobody's teaching people how to actually use these tools, you know? And so, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's like, similarly, I, I kind of love what you're saying about C and computers crashing because that is how you learn, I think. Yeah. Well, the thing was, is like people are, people were telling me, they're like, you know, no one's going to use your book unless it's in the browser because they have to install stuff. Mm-hmm. And I went, but what you do all day, usually is installing and fixing stuff. Like I'd say 90% of a programmer's job in the beginning of a project is literally just installing stuff, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. So if, if I remove that, if I remove you have to install Python, I'm not really teaching you how to use Python. I'm not really teaching you how to use your computer, you know? Like literally the problem they're trying to remove is a non-problem. It's like they're removing baking soda from cakes. Like, well, I need baking soda. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's how you make a cake, you know? Sure. Um, or they're like, you know, teaching people to play guitar. Like, do you need strings? It's so hard. It's like, yes, that's a guitar. It has strings. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So for me, it was, I would say that was like the primary difference is, uh, I'd say my, my course is much simpler. It's much more directed. There's no gaming to it. You go at your own pace. It's just simpler. You just one exercise after another, taking notes, lots of advice of how to study, how to learn things. 
Um, it's much more gradual, you know, and then no distractions, you know, it's the kind of thing where you can sit there with like a cup of wine or a tea and do your coding, you know, um, and there's, it's just no frills, mostly because I just don't have the money to do thrill frills. So I focus on a very simple, straightforward way to learn. That's wonderful. I'd like to know a little bit more about, um, about some of the resources that you might recommend for people to learn to code. Cause you said you, you said there's not just one solution. So it sounds like you're open to, um, maybe some other, other books or platforms. Is there anything that, that you would recommend or maybe even something that, that you use when you're trying to learn a new coding language? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, I recently had to learn modern JavaScript. We're talking like actual modern JavaScript. So ES6 um, is actually sort of almost like two languages now where like you have like a, a very modern JavaScript that solves all of JavaScript's major pain points. And then you have an older style. And they, they kind of coexist. It's actually really well done, I think. I, I, I bag on JavaScript, but I think ES6 is like a, is an elegant thing. And... Um, Honestly, like I still think because of the way people teach programming, it's diff and it's difficult to learn new languages because the documentation is terrible. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to learn ES6, I had to like piece together things from random blogs and I'm trying to read the spec and the spec doesn't mention half the stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it took me six months to figure out you could put async, the async keyword kind of anywhere. I thought you could only do certain things. I read a blog post that was saying, oh, you can't do it with functions. It's just weird. And they, and that's the big thing. Like trying to learn a new language is really tough. Most of what I do is what everyone else does, Googling around, reading their docs, write, reading other people's code, and then trying to write stuff. So once you get past like, like if you say you do my Python book or something like that, anything, right? You get past where you, you feel like you can code. The best way you learn to do things is like building stuff, trying to make stuff. And you, that forces you to research what's out there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as resources go, uh, I, I'm sort of like interested in a lot of stuff like, um, uh, circuit Python, I think is, is, is called, there's like a version of Python that runs on things like Arduinos and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. um, I think I've seen it coming out of, out, out of Adafruit or something. Um, I'm really interested in like, can you shove the cost of learning to code down as small as possible? where you could get like a $1 microcontroller package. Maybe the whole thing costs 10 bucks, runs off your TV, and then you can learn Python, right? That's that's what I would love to do that. Um, Making it accessible for as many, many people as possible is what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about it. Everyone has a TV, like all over the world. That's like a, like an essential Not thing. Not in New York, but yeah. <laughs> in New York we're a little yeah, weird. Yeah, we don't yeah. have cars, we don't have TVs, <laughs> but yeah, most people don't do. have. <laughs> don't have any space. Where are you going to yeah, put your TV? Yeah, we don't have any space. You know? That's you know? the problem. I moved to Miami. I have two TVs now. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. Um, but you know what I mean, right? So like you could have a family. Like one of the things that they first buy or they really enjoy is their TV. Um, so being able to have like a small, tiny device that gave me like, you know, I mean, you can get a, a, a microcontroller these days that's like around 75 megahertz. That's enough to run some basic Python, especially if it's like a small little VM. Yeah. Um, and then hook that up to a TV, a keyboard, done, right? Don't even have to do too much with that. So making it just, just um, really especially easy. If, yeah. Like, making no it really accessible, you know? Yeah. Um. Now, as far as like other resources to learn, um, I, I really like Code Newbies. I think they do a really good thing. But um, I, I mean, I'm a pro, so it's kind of like I just I don't go to beginner resources very much, and I don't review them very much. You know, I don't use them. Yeah. Um, what so is it's this, hard for me to recommend. What is the site you just mentioned? Code Newbies. Is that what you call it? Uh, Code Newbies is sort of a. I'm not sure if it's a site or a project. It's run by um, Saren. Saren. Uh, I think her last name is Yet Barak. I met her once. And she does a Twitter account, and then she answers a bunch of questions. They'll do like an a question and answer thing, and then she runs a a conference. And let me just use the power of the internet. Look this up. Oh, okay, yeah, I I, I see it. Yeah, CodeNewbies.org. Yeah, I like I like a lot of yeah. yeah, yeah. I like a lot of what she does because it's um. It just seems to be kind of really genuine and um. Uh, code newbies. And I cannot spell newbie at all. Yeah, code newbie.org. Yeah. 
I like what, a lot of what she's doing because um, it's just very simple kind of, you know, just people talking about code and they got a little, yeah, Code Land is the conference. They got a little conference. People show oh, cool. up and just talk about, you know. And the conference is really cheap. It's 99 bucks, you know. That is like the cheapest conference expensive. I've ever heard of. That's amazing. Oh, it's here in New York City. Oh, you great. Know? Yeah, this is a great resource. Cool. Yeah, it's it's in New York City. Um, I think GitHub sponsored them. Yeah, that's what it know? looks like. Yeah. And, uh, they get like some pretty good people to show up and do the talks, um, uh, all all from all over. I mean, they got Jen Simmons, designer, and uh, all kinds of people. And then um, it just seems to be very genuinely people interested in beginning coders, you know. Whereas like a lot of other conferences, it seems like they're, um, it's a, much more at trying to get them to join their product clan, you know. Yeah. You know, become a pro- become a Python guy. Become a Microsoft guy. Yeah. And then Code Newbies is like, we like code. <laughs> We're just excited. Yeah. That's what it feels like from yeah, looking yeah. at the site. This is cool. It looks like a Dr. Seuss yeah, novel. Yeah, yeah. This is cool. Uh this is really great. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um are there any are there any programming languages that you're excited about? You mentioned the like the Arduino a little bit. Is there is there something else that's on your mind like in the future or that you're actively trying to learn? Uh yeah. So uh like I mentioned, JavaScript ES six. Yeah. So ES6. before ES six yeah, it was garbage. I hated JavaScript. I think everyone hated JavaScript. Yeah. Um, but ES ES six fixed. I'm gonna say like 99 percent of the issues, and you can literally code everything in ES six and never even used old JavaScript. It's it's great. Um. So my new book, uh, Learn JavaScript the Hard Way. Uh, I'm gonna finish it soon, but uh, that's gonna be sort of a combo of what I learned from learn Python and learn more Python the hard way all combined into one book streamlined a lot less of the professional development, more fun. Um, so that's the big thing. So from that I'm learning, um, uh, I'm learning about Vue.js. Uh, I'm learning about Svelte is another thing I'm learning about, um, uh, some of the, the gaming and graphics JavaScript stuff. And the JavaScript world is massive, tons of packages. It's incredibly impressive. Yeah. Especially given like, like the pile of garbage that JavaScript was, the amount of stuff they built with that pile of garbage is just insane. You know, <laughs> it's very, it's very impressive. Um, yeah, ja- JavaScript, that, also, just to give a little bit of context, that just got me excited to remember. I, I remember trying to learn JavaScript in like the late nineties and it was, it was just basically a joke language. Um, and I think one of oh, the yeah. main reasons was that not only was development on it really slow, but there was the whole browser wars. And I think that really, that really kind of slowed down development of the web languages, especially JavaScript, because there wasn't every browser would read it differently. And it, it wasn't, I'm kind yeah, of, yeah. I'm kind of like summarizing this, but it, I remember it wasn't until like Chrome and Safari and like these kind of dev tools that like JavaScript began to start to become something people would use. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I would say for me, the main, like you said, JavaScript was this joke language you could barely use mostly because it was impossible to debug. Like I remember trying to debug JavaScript by putting alerts yes. in the code until I found the line that caused a failure. Yes. I'm just like, this is pathetic. This is, and then people are coming to me and saying, you should do learn Python the hard way in a browser. I'm like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> just you can't do anything in the browser. It's a terrible platform. Uh, but now it's like a whole renaissance. It's a total Vue.js is beautiful. I love yeah. using Vue.js. React is apparently the same. Svelte is becoming really cool. Elm, Elm is like a whole language that just makes that all go away. Oh, all that awesome, stuff is exciting. Yeah. The developer tools are good. Um, the inspection stuff is great. Uh, yeah, it's just a totally different game now. Um, so I'm excited about that. I mean, that's one of the only reasons. Like, I have bad blood with JavaScript. I hate JavaScript. Um, <laughs> I absolutely hated it, but now I'm like, you know, oh man, you can do some cool stuff and it's literally saving me time. I think that's the big thing is. That's exciting. When people, um, yeah, when they think about me, got to remember I'm a single entrepreneur. I'm doing this all by myself. So if I got to use something that takes me 20 hours and I can switch over to say like Vue.js or something else and it saves me that 20 hours, that's cash money. So I'm going to switch. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, Vue.js handles all my stuff and I'm done. I'm done. I'm moving on, you know? Yeah. What do you use Vue.js um, for right now? Um, so basically, uh, my my site's a little on the old side. It's a lot on the old side. And I'm running Django and I hate it. I hate Django so much. That's the Python framework, um, yeah. So, yeah. So what I did is I cooked up in like a weekend, a Vue.js chat thing with streaming video in it. 
So that gives you an idea. So I can literally live stream coding sessions with people and they can chat with me. Oh. It's not super elegant, but it looks decent. And I did it in like a weekend, refined it over a couple of weeks. Um, I would never be able to do anything like that in, in Rails, Django, anything. It would be nearly impossible. This was like tiny amount of code, really effortless. It worked really great. Um, it was it was a whole game. It's a, it's a total game changer. So do you think, do um, you think, you, I mean, just to kind of repeat what you said and make sure it's clear. So mm-hmm. um, do you think that Vue.js is like the kind of, the best framework that people should be learning right now as opposed to Ruby on Rails or Django? Um, yeah, so so keep in mind, Vue.js is just front-end. But yes. what it does is it solves a ton of the headaches, primarily because you can have pluggable components into it. And when you use their single-page components, you can basically, in one in one little file, do everything you need to get like your JavaScript up, your styling working, and uh, the markup. And then that can just be plugged in. So it's a huge win. But also... The development environment along with that is very nice like it's uh, like you you sort of just change a file and it magically mm. shows up in your browser no refresh and not even change a file just change one small component and it yeah. just changes dynamically crazy fast people don't understand like how much of a pain it is to be sitting there coding and having to refresh refresh, refresh all day long yeah and, yeah if you think if that's like three or four seconds and you do that like 200 times um a day well, you know, not doing that saved you actually a ton of time over the year, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I would say I would say Vue.js isn't the best. Um, it's it's pretty good. I think it's the most consistent, and it doesn't have any baggage. Is its advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, React had sort of this really bad era where you had to hand code the HTML with raw JavaScript, and I was just like, nope, not even going to bother. Um, but now they've got JSX, so I think React and Vue are on like par with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, my primary reason for using Vue is that I tend to target my books at things where I don't think evil corporations have total control of it, you know? So Facebook controls React or it's, eh, I'm just like a little dodgy going with React because of that. Mm. Um, but within that whole single page app reactive framework world, which I think is actually the future, I'm really into uh, React, I'm into Vue, Svelte looks very cool. And Elm is a whole programming language that seems to be really nice too. So I'm checking all four of those out. That's really cool. And what database do you prefer these days? Oh, I super don't care about the database. I mean, um, I'm trying to, I like Postgres, but Postgres has some serious issues that I'm having problems with. Um, They just, it's not a modern network stack inside Postgres. So it has problems with keeping connections open and things like that. Yeah. So I've been looking at some of the more recent, um, kind of you you had sort of like the no sql databases now there's sort of like this in-betweener world where it does all the stuff your sql database does and then all the stuff that you need like it's got geography in it and search and all this stuff um so i've been um using um uh, rethink db is cool orango db is cool um there's a couple others uh influx if you need time series and uh there's a few others i've been checking out and um, and I kind of like all of them. I mean, I think Rethink is slightly different purpose than, say, Arango or um, uh, Influx. So it's sort of like you can kind of use all of those. Cool. And uh, I think my one of my last questions here is just I'm curious, do you have a preference for where you host your website or any of the tools that you use? I think a lot of people getting started are always kind of wondering, you know, there's so many options out there of places that you can hook all this stuff up to or any best practices, any tools that that you'd recommend people check out? Uh, Yeah. So I think the thing to keep in mind is that I'm ultra old school. So I, I grew up, like I said, (laughs) running my own Linux server so I can sys admin things. Right. Uh, So my advice is, well, first off, and I also sell courses and the number one rule when you do stuff online for sale, is control your distribution, like control your platform. So the last thing you want is um, you're, you're making money off Patreon. And then uh, for whatever reason, suddenly they throw you off Patreon and you don't make any money, right? Yeah. Um, or you're putting your things on YouTube or your things are on Vimeo or whatever. It can always happen that, it happen that you're just out. So I'm a big advocate of if you make money on your stuff, you got to host your own stuff. For that reason alone, because hosting is much more difficult to shut down uh, for arbitrary reasons, right? 
And people think like, well, what's arbitrary? Like what could happen to you uh, as you're just teaching people to code? It's not like, you know, I'm a Nazi or something like that, right? Um, it's actually possible, and I've had people attempt to do this, where if someone just doesn't like, um, like I think, believe, uh, I said it in like Python 3 strings once, and then some dude tried to get my book removed from all the books on the internet to try to shut my business down. Wow. Um, yeah, you could just one day just send the wrong tweet about some someone likes Haskell, you know, and then he decides to go on the war path and just ruin your life. So if I was on a platform, say like um, any of those, those um, you know, Coursera, any of those systems that you can host a course and make money on, they could go in and claim copyright, the DMCA. They can claim you did something. They can claim all kinds of things and shut you down for a week or permanently. Yeah. Whereas if I run my own stuff, if I run my own stuff, they can't do anything, right? That's yeah. like, I can still make money. I can still host. Yeah. Uh, I, I so don't think you're, exa I don't think you're exaggerating with that. I just would add that, you know, we had a real experience with that at one month, we moved our blog at one point to medium. It was popular a few years to host company blogs on medium it sort of still is, but long story short, um, yeah, they they messed something up and they couldn't figure out why, but our blog wasn't showing up for almost a full week. Um, and then what happened was we lost just so much. I mean, Google really penalizes you and you're just like 404 yeah. erroring on every single page. Um, and it was just kind of like really out of our control, you know. Um, yeah. It, they could pull you off. They could have errors. Yeah, you're really reliant on... It kind of goes back to that analogy that you had about like learning how to code and driving a car. It's like you're basically like on a bus and you're like, I hope we know where we're going. But with the way that you're talking about yeah, yeah. hosting your site is like you have control. You can decide when things are running. You can decide where to go. You can decide how to, you know, pull over if you, whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Now, now, keep in mind, if I can find something that I can grab, I'll, I'll pay for it, too. And then host myself. Mm -hmm. I'll do that, right? So, like, um, I really like Discourse. I use that for my forum. Yeah. And that I can just go and I can. There's all kinds of hosting companies you can say, make me a Discourse. And Discourse, they're super nice. Their stuff is free. You can pay for it on their platform. Yep. And just run it yourself. Yep. And that's what I do. Um, as I use a Zendesk to receive my help request, I'll pay for that, no problem. Like if someone shuts down my Zendesk, I just switch to regular email. I don't really care about that. Sure. Uh, but the main distribution is my own site. I run my own software. I use a hosting company. Um, it's much harder, but I'm an old pro. So for me, it's just, it's kind of fun. And in some ways, it's frustrating, but um, I like running my own stuff and getting it set up. Uh, mm -hmm. If other people are just trying to host their plain old websites, you can use almost anything. You know, Heroku, any of those guys where they just like you put it up and you're done. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, Hey Zed, this was super fun talking to you today. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It's fun. I love talking about coding and stuff. Like yeah, that. I can, I can, I can tell. Yeah. I think I think we found our match. I'm also just like totally nerding out and loving yeah. this conversation. Um, and also, it's cool to learn. I feel like I learned a lot about your platform and kind of where, where you're coming from because, like I said, I've been using your tutorials and recommending our students to them for years. So it's it's super cool to hear the story and kind of like the culture as well that you've developed. I think you know in your community uh, about what's important and your your way of your way of learning. So thanks for sharing that with us today yeah yeah no problem yeah i mean it's like i've always tried to push i would say like a primary difference in philosophy is other other places sort of want to indoctrinate you into being a good customer and i try to make mine so you don't need me anymore right i want you to be independent right so i want you to buy my book get through it and then go do other stuff you know i don't want you to keep coming back and needing me i love you know, it unless i make something you need you know um, so I think that's, that's always been my philosophy, you know, just, I like independent free thinkers and people who think for their self, you know, and, um, that's, that's served me well so far. Well said for people listening, if they want to learn, learn more, uh, where should they go? Uh, they can go to, uh, learn code, the hard org, And you can also go to learn Python, the hard way or learn Ruby, the hard org, And those are two other ones. All of the links notes, everything we talked about, even the full transcript of every word is available at onemonth.com. If you want to go and read that while you're there, you can go to onemonth.com forward slash newsletter and sign up for the weekly newsletter. I write it personally. You can reply back, ask me questions. 
I am there for you if you have any questions. Learning to code, getting your superpowers, figuring out how to make sense of all the different resources that are out there. I'm there for you. Just let me know and uh, just go to onemonth.com and you can get all of that. As well as take courses with me. Uh, I have courses in HTML, JavaScript, Python, all of that is online as well. And it makes a really good kind of, uh, you know, compendium if you use Zed's books as well. They go really nice together. There are many more episodes of this podcast. Wherever you're listening to this episode, you can get more. Uh, it's also on iTunes and Spotify where you can subscribe. We have really great episodes with uh, Matan Griffel, my co-founder, who is teaching MBAs how to code Python. There's a great episode on that. Episode with Chris Coyer from the Shop Talk Show podcast talking about front-end development, as well as Nathan Bachez, who is one of the co-creators of Product Hunt and he created Hardbound or Gimlet Media. And we talk a lot about how he learned to code and some of the great resources that are out there for beginners as well. So all of that, so much more. I hope you're having a good time wherever you are. And I hope to see you, listen to you, hear you, you hear me, something. Hope we get to hang out sometime soon. It's a little late where I am now, but I hope you're having a great day, night. Who are you? This shit gets existential really quick. All right. Be well, be well, be well, be well, my people. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Like we're on the phone now. Like we're on the phone. Bye.